Wanna verbalize it or send it to me? Um I'll send it. Okay. Send just one page of it. If there's multiple pages, send the first page and then send the, the others. All right. The more pages you add, the greater the time it takes to send to get to me, and it's exponential. It's not linear. <laughs> All right. Just tell me when it says email sent. There you go. Now, if you have two or three other pages that you want to send, go ahead and take pictures of them, and you can put them all in the same email. By the time we get done with this page, I will have gotten it, but this page looks like it could take us most of the session. Okay. We'll send one more. All right. That'll do it for sure. Tell me when you're ready to begin on this. I'm ready to begin. Okay. So these are pretty easy. When you have, this means you're adding the two functions. Okay. okay. So if I add those two functions, what do I get? Uh, 3x plus 5 um, plus 2x minus 3. You want to add the variable part? And then you want to add the, the number part. So you end up with 5x plus 2. It's as simple as that. Okay. Okay. F minus G, same thing. What do you get? Um, so it would be 1x... Um, Minus 2. What is 5 minus a minus 3? Oh, uh, positive 2. Do not drop negative signs. The biggest mistake in math is dropping negative signs. I guess it's because everybody hates them, but you can't drop them. You drop even one, you'll get it wrong. G minus F. So this time I'm reversing the order of subtraction. So there's F. And I'm going to subtract the two. What do you get? So it'd be negative X. Um, and then... Positive 2. It's minus 3, minus 5. Oh, minus 8. Okay. F times G. Well, that's uh, just foiling. In yeah. other words, you just have a binomial term times another binomial term. Go ahead. So, and do that. What do you get? 6x squared, and then minus 15. I want you to do it term by term in the same order every single time. In other words, I want you to do that term first, which you just did. And then I want you to do the O of FOIL, which is the two outside terms. That's minus 9x. Then I want you to do the two inside terms. That's the I of FOIL. That's plus 10X. And finally, the final, the last two terms are minus 15. 
Now, almost yeah. always you can combine the two middle terms only. So what do you get? 1x minus 15. Yeah, and we'll forget your 6x squared. Dividing. So, well, hold would on. you? Hold on a minute. They've made this particularly difficult. That's what we're going to do. Uh, yeah. The thing is, is that I don't know where we go from that. That's a final answer. Okay. That, that is the answer. I can't simplify it. I can't divide top and bottom by anything. I can't factor anything out and cancel it. Uh, if I try to do the multiplication, I just get 1 plus some remainder. Um, or if I try to do the division, rather. So I think that's the answer. Okay. Okay. Let's go on. When they say rewrite the expression, what they mean is write it with a fractional exponent. Don't write it with a radical sign. So what's the equivalent way to write this expression right there? Um, would it just be x? x to the one-half. That's what the one-half exponent means, is square root. If you had okay. one-third exponent, that would mean the cube root. All right. Okay. So when they say rewrite it, I guess this one they want you to write with the radical sign. Well, okay. You would write that? Um, is there the rule where, is it the bottom? The bottom is out the root, and the top is the exponent. So the root goes there. Yeah, so 3x the goes there. X. Okay, yeah. In other words, these two are identical. Now, 35. Let's do 35 multiple steps. First step, eliminate the radical sign. What would you get? Um, x cubed? No, that's not x cubed. That's cube root. Cube root is this. Okay. Okay. Now, that's not really the answer they want, though. They want the answer to look like this. A negative exponent with x in the numerator. Just be sure you see why all three of these are the same. They're all equal. Okay. Okay. The following, no negative exponents. Well, simplify each expression with no negative exponents. So if I want to write x to the minus 2 without a negative exponent, what is it? Um, I'm not sure. It's real easy. It's 1 over x to the positive exponent. That's what a negative exponent means. That's the only thing it means. Yep. Okay? If I write 3 to the minus 7 power, that's the same thing as 1 over 3 to the plus 7 power. Remember that negative exponents do not mean negative numbers. They merely yep. mean the reciprocal to a positive exponent. Okay, so how can I write y to the minus 3? Um, would it be 1 over y to the third, to yeah. 3? Uh-huh, and there's your answer. 
In other words, we, I don't know that we simplified it, but we definitely wrote it without negative exponents. Um, 37, I can't tell if that's a minus sign in front of the six thirds or that's just a long fraction bar. I think it is a minus sign. So what we really have is x squared to the minus 6 thirds, which is minus 2. What's that? Um. Now, when they say no negative exponents, you can use them in getting to your answer. So just use the rules of exponents. What does that become? Um, x. Multiply the exponents. When you are doing double exponentiation, which is what we're doing here, you multiply the exponents. Okay? Okay. Now, that's not a proper answer because it's got a negative exponent. So give me the answer with a positive exponent. So 1 over x to the 4th. Yeah, that's the answer. But how do you get to the x squared minus 2 there? Well, here, let's go back. 6 over 3 is 2. Yeah. So, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a minus sign in front of that 6 over 3. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's the same as minus 2. Yeah, I see. Okay. Now you multiply the exponents, you get x to the minus 4, and then you convert it to a no negative exponent. All right. About 38. Now, everything in the parentheses is acted upon by this one half. Okay. Okay. So... Go through number first, then variable, first variable you encounter next, and then the second variable you encounter. And just apply the square root to each one of them. So what's the square root of 64? Um, 8. Now, let's talk about x to the 7th. What is the square root of x to the seventh? Well, the way to find that would be to separate it into the square root of x to the sixth times the square root of x. Okay, you with me? Yeah. The square root of x to the sixth. You can't get that, can you? Yeah, x to the third. Okay. The reason is, is that x to the third squared is x to the sixth. Therefore, yeah. the square root of x to the sixth is x to the third. And the reason it's x to the sixth is because x to the third times x to the third is x to the sixth. So that is x cubed. Well, we still have the square root of x. So that's what x to the, the square root of x to the seventh is. So, so far, what we have is this. Handling the number 64 and the x to the seventh. Now tell me what the square root of y to the tenth is. Um, so what you do... Multiply the exponents. You got double exponentiation going on there. So 10, so 5? Uh-huh. That's all you have to do. Y to the fifth. And if they want it without radical sign, then I might write it like this. X to the third, Y to the fifth, X to the one-half, and I can even put that one-half there. So I could theoretically write it like that, and that actually is the simplest form. Maybe I'd want to write it like this. 8x to the 7 halves, y to the 5th. There, to me, is the perfect answer.
but this one's okay, and this one's okay. And in fact, if we go back and let's handle the X again, I didn't need to go through all this. Up here at the top left, waste of time. I don't know why I did it. I didn't realize that there was a simpler way. Treat it as double exponentiation. You have X to the seventh to the one half. Well, what's that equal to? X to the seven halves. Yep. Was our final answer, actually. So I didn't need to do anything special. I just needed to multiply the exponents together. Okay. All right. Number 39. Now, what I advise on number 39 is, again, they merely don't want any negative exponents in their answer. There is no problem with using negative exponents to get to your answer. So let's do this step by step. And the first thing to do is we got double exponentiation going on here. So let's apply this exponent to every single thing, to the number 3, to the variable x, and to the variable y to the fourth. So what is 3 to the minus 3? Um, we can just write yeah. it as 3 to the minus 3 for the moment because this okay. is going to be our final answer. We're on the way to our final answer. Okay, what's the next term? What's the x going to be? Um, 1 over x3. Well, we'll start it out as minus 3. But you're right. That does turn into 1 over x to the 3. And what about the y? Um, y minus 3? No, multiply the exponents. That's your first step. Oh, uh, minus 12. Okay. Now, we've got the answer. It's just they all have negative exponents. So we have yep. to change it. So that becomes, what is 3 cubed? Um, and I'll write it. We'll just write it like this for the moment. And then the x becomes positive 3. The y becomes positive 12. You with me? Yeah. Okay. Now that becomes 1 over 27 is 3 cubed times x cubed times y to the 12. This is the answer they want. Okay. okay. In other words, we've simplified it. We've done everything we can possibly do, and we've removed all negative exponents. Rewrite the following in graphing form. Do they mean vertex format? Uh, yeah, that's what I think. Okay. Because there's actually three different forms. All can be graphed from that form. So graphing form isn't very specific. But if it's vertex format, give me the standard form for vertex format. Is that y equals mx plus b? No, that's a straight line. That's a linear equation. This is a quadratic. Uh, this is a parabola. Um, y equals... Is this the HK? Uh-huh. Remember, one of them has to be squared. So there's the vertex format. And the reason this is a particularly good format is because these things are all parabolas. Okay, well, the most important part of a parabola is the vertex right there. Yeah. Very few other parts really matter, but that vertex is very important. So it's really important to know how to find the vertex. Now, there's other ways. I could use the minus b over 2a to find the vertex, but that's not what this problem says. This problem says 
put it into vertex format. Okay? Well, there is a particular way that you do that. I'm going to do the first one for you. And then hope you can do the second one. When you put something into vertex format, you isolate the variables. And you separate the number like that. Okay? Yeah. And the most important thing is don't change it from line to line. In other words, that better be the same as that. And it is. I haven't done anything other than add parentheses to the first two terms. Now, the trick is to complete the square. If I complete the square inside the parentheses, then I'm going to be able to write it as some x minus h squared. That's the reason we complete the square. How do you complete the square? Um... Take half of the x coefficient and square it. So by x? Half of the x coefficient. What's the x coefficient? 6. Okay, take half of that and square it. So, it's, so 9. Uh-huh, that's always what you do. Okay, now when I write 9 in there, I just changed it. Just added 9 to the whole right side of the equation. So if I want to balance it, i got to subtract 9. And now, if I simplify that, that becomes x minus 3 squared. In other words, I'm always going to be able to write that as a linear term squared. And this becomes minus 1. I merely add those two numbers. Okay. Okay. And A ends up being 1. There's a 1 out there. Sometimes yeah. we'll have an A other than 1, but in this particular quadratic, A is 1. So I've got it in perfect vertex format. Tell All me right. what A, H, and K are. So A is in... 1. What's H? H is negative 3. No. Nope. Here's the general format. X minus H. What is H when I'm looking at X uh, minus 3? It's just 3. What's K? 1. Or oh, minus 1. Okay. And that's all we really have to do. In other words... We didn't even have to do that part there. They didn't ask us to graph it. They just said rewrite it in graphing form, which means presumably rewrite it in vertex format. Well, we got it in perfect vertex format, meaning that we can see the vertex. The vertex is that number and that number. That's the x-coordinate of the vertex. That's the y-coordinate of the vertex. Okay. So the way you convert regular format, standard format, into vertex format is this way, by completing the square. You have to complete the square every time. Okay, so I want you to do it to the other one. Okay, um, so y equals... And then parentheses, x squared, um, plus 10x. And then here do you do what? Leave room to complete the square. Notice I left a big space there. Yeah. I still have plus 8. Okay. Can't get rid of that. So it's all yeah. I've done is... Basically, added parentheses and left some room. Yep. Now complete the square inside the parentheses. Um, so would you do 
5, take half of 10 and get 5. Now square it. Um, 25, so plus 25. And then balance it. So do you have to um, minus 25? Uh -huh. If I'm on the same side, I have to minus 25. If I'm doing this and there's something else on the other side, then I would just add 25 to the other side. But okay. it depends on whether you're balancing it on the same side or the other side. Okay. Now, how can I write that? By definition, because I completed the square, how can I write it? Um, so y equals x. Um, Whatever you got when you took half of that. Oh, um, plus 5? That's always what it is. In other okay. words, take half of that coefficient with the sign, and that's what you're going to write there. In other words, okay. this is x squared plus 10x plus 25. And yep. it's always going to be. In other words, the whole reason we complete the square is so that we can write this as a single linear term square. Okay. And what's the rest of it? And then minus 13. I mean 17. 17. And again, now we have it in perfect vertex format, which is all they ask for. So we'll go on. Distance between two points. Every one of these problems requires you to know a general formula, okay? In other words, if you didn't know what the general vertex format was, you could not have done 40 or 41. If you yeah. don't know what the distance formula is, you can't do 42 or 43. So if you don't know these formulas, then it's not working with me that you need to do. It's, you need a method of memorizing. All right. And the best method I know of is index cards. Okay. Get yourself a dozen three by five index cards. On one side, write distance formula. That's it. On the other side, write the square root of x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. And once you have a, a bunch of these index cards, and this is all you're going to write on the other side, okay? Then you shuffle them up. You turn some of them inside out. You go through them, and if you're looking at this side, See if you know the other side. If you're looking at that side, see if you know what it is. And then take a look. Make sure, in other words, if this is the side you happen to see, then you're looking at the distance formula. If this is what you happen to see, then you need to give the distance formula. But this is a terrific way to memorize stuff. And math is all about memorizing. You really got no shot if you can't memorize. I mean, truly. If, if uh, there was a famous movie once where a guy only had like a five minute memory, he couldn't remember beyond five minutes, and uh, he would have been horrible at math. He would have had no, no chance at it. So you gotta remember that. So, I can make it a little easier to remember this. Let me do it since I usually do that for everybody. If I have the distance between two points, what is that line? That line is the hypotenuse of a triangle. If I created the triangle, that would be the hypotenuse of a right triangle, correct? Correct. And that 
would be the difference in the y's, which is y sub 2 minus y sub 1. And this is the difference in the x's, which is x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Well, the hypotenuse of any right triangle is the square root of delta y squared plus delta x squared. And you'll notice that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the square root of, it doesn't matter what order you put them in, delta x squared plus delta y squared. Now, I know you don't know this term delta. What delta means is the change. What's the change in x? The change in x is the difference between the two x terms. The change in y is the difference between the two y terms. Now, whenever they're asking you about the distance between two points, 99% of the time, it's the hypotenuse of a triangle. So you're always using this formula. Occasionally, the two points will be in a straight line. And if they say, what are the distance between these two points? Well, if that's a horizontal line, then it's just the difference in the x-coordinates. That's the distance. So for horizontal lines or vertical lines, that'd be the difference in the y-coordinates. That's the distance. So those are easy. The only ones that are hard is when it's a slanted line that has a little slope to it. Then it's the hypotenuse of that right triangle. And that is the Pythagorean theorem. That's what the distance formula is, is the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so I'm going to leave it up for the first one. And I want, it, want you to have it memorized by the time we get to the second one. Because then I'll erase it. There's a little trick to memorizing. And the trick is you don't ever want to memorize something by just having that written on a piece of paper in front of you and reading it every time. That does not memorize diddly. The way to memorize stuff is you got to try to memorize. You got to try to memorize it and then you got to put your source material away and when it calls for the distance formula, write it down. And then if you have to check to see if you've written it down correctly, that's, that's a different story. That's okay. But never just look it up because what happens is you'll never memorize it. It doesn't sink in through osmosis. It just doesn't. You have to purposefully take active measures to memorize stuff. You don't necessarily have to do index cards. But the worst thing you could do would be to have a page of all of these formulas in front of you. And whenever we get to a problem, you just look it up on the page. That wouldn't do anybody any good, including you. Okay. So, for this problem, I'm going to let you see this. For 43, I'm going to erase this. Let's do 42. What's the distance equal to? Um, so, here, let me label these. That's X and Y for one point. That's X and Y for the second point. Um, if you like, I'll make it X sub 1, Y sub 1, X sub 2, Y sub 2. Now just plug it in to this formula. So... Plug it in and then we'll simplify. Don't do any math in your head at all. Just plug it in. Okay. So you do negative. Uh, What's x sub 2? 1 minus 1. No. What's x sub 1? Minus 5. Okay. And that's a negative minus 5. I got to square all of that. Plus, now do the same thing on the y's. What's y sub 2? So 3. Hold on. No, that's y sub 1. 
negative 1, 3. All right. So now we have to simplify this. So start always from the inside parentheses and work your way out. So this first part, what is 1 minus a negative 5 equal to? Um, it's going to be negative 4. Nope. 1 minus a negative 5. Those two minus signs turn into a plus. Okay, so 6. And then 6 squared is 36. And then I'm adding to it, what is minus 1 minus 3? Minus 4. Square it. Um, positive 16. Okay. Now I add those two. So um, 52. Now simplify it, because that's not simplified. Um, square root of 52 is... Um, I don't think you can square it, can you? Well, what you're looking for is factors of 52, where one of them is a perfect square number. About 4 and 13. 4 being yeah. a perfect square number. That allows me to write it that way. And that's your answer. That's the distance between those two points. That would be the length of the hypotenuse. Okay. Okay? Now, I'm going to erase everything. I want you to do 43. Okay. I'll do it up here. The distance equals... I'll get you started. Always that. Um, I don't want you to do any math in your head. I want you to just fill it in. That's the way to do all these problems. Uh, don't, okay. don't do more than one step at a time. Always. Until you get so good that you're never going to make a mistake. And then you can do two steps at once. All right. So, would it begin five plus 1 squared? Minus. Subtract minus. what's going on. It's x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Okay. Okay. Plus, so, and remember, what, what this is, is the difference in the x coordinates. That's delta yeah. x. Well, you can see the distance between 5 and 1 is 4. So you wouldn't want to make it 5 plus 1. That's mm -hmm. not the distance between the x-coordinates. What we want are the distance between the x-coordinates. Okay, we got it. And what do we want over here? 6 minus 2 nope. squared. You dropped a negative sign. Oh, 6 plus 2 squared? Well, it's 6 minus a minus 2. Okay. In other words, there's y sub 2. I'm subtracting y sub 1. So if I want y sub 2 minus y sub 1, then it's 6 minus a minus 2. Just write everything out. The only reason you drop a negative sign is because you're trying to do two steps at once. Don't do it. Just do one step at a time. And now convert. Now simplify. What's 5 minus 1 squared? It's 4 squared, which is 16. What's 6 minus a minus 2? Um, 8 squared. That's 64. So that is the square root of 80. But that can also be simplified. Look... For factors of 80, where one of the factors is a perfect square number. Um, Not square. 8 and 10. Because neither 8 nor 10 are perfect square numbers. 
So square root of 4 and 20. Okay, we'll start there. That's not the most efficient answer, but we'll start there. And that turns into this. How can square root of 20 be simplified? No. What are factors of 20? Are any factors of 20 perfect square numbers? Uh, five. Five and four. Here's your perfect square numbers. It's really good to know these by heart. Because when you're simplifying radicals, you've got to know these. Okay? So I'm looking for factors of 20. Are, are there any factors of 20 that match one of these numbers over here? Oh. Okay. So it's 2 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. That produces another 2. So now I got 2 times 2 times root 5 which gives you 4 root 5. And that's what it simplifies to. Now, let me show you the advantage of coming up with the maximum perfect square number. You, We separated it into 4 times 20. What if I had separated it into 16 times 5, which are factors of 80? That immediately gets me to the final answer, much quicker. Yeah. I don't have to then break down the root 20. So the moral of the story is, is that if you want to do it the most efficient possible way, find the maximum factor of 80 that is a perfect square number. That would be 16. You can still do it by using 4, but you'll have to do it multiple times. In other words, we'll have to break it down into 4 times 20, and then we'll have to break down 20. So it's always better to come up with the maximum one. If I said, what's the square root of 200, you would not want to do square root of 4 times square root of 50. You'd want to do square root of 100 times square root of 2, because this gets to the answer immediately, 10 root 2. Even though 4 is a perfect square number, it's not as big as 100 is, which is also a perfect square number. Okay. Huh? All right. We got 15 minutes. Let's have a look at that second page you sent me. Piecewise functions give people a lot of trouble, but they really shouldn't. Okay. And I'll explain myself. If I look at this number 44, okay, and I go to graph it. Hold on a second. I have two areas of interest. Everything to the left of x equal 3 and everything to the right of x equal 3. In other words, I've got this area over here that I have to put a function in, and I have this area over here that I have to put a function in. And that's the way to look at all of these piecewise functions. Okay? In other words, start there. Don't start with the function. Start with the domain. Yep. That's what I've circled, is the domain of each piecewise function. And then just graph them as you would if that was the function for the whole way. In other words, I know how to graph 4x minus 3. Start at minus 3. I go up 4 to the right 1 to get my slope of 4, and then I graph it. 
that is 4x minus 3. And it's less than only, so I put an open circle right there, not a closed circle. Okay, you with me? Yeah. Now, there's two ways that I can do the second one. And for years, I did it the hard way. And I'll show you this way because this will make very much sense to you. If I were to graph that whole line all the way to the y-axis in green, let me do it, okay? Uh, in other words, it would go, it would start at plus 2, then it would have a slope of 5, so I'd go up 5 over 1, nah, let me say it's like that, okay? And then I would graph that entire line. But that line is only the line when x is greater than or equal to 3. So I would really erase everything to the left of the line x equal 3. I don't have that part of the green line. My function is going to be this. Close dot that. Okay, now I don't need this scribbly stuff here. I drew that only so you could see what the domain was. And I don't need the yellow either. And my end result is what I have here. Now, there's a really an easier way to do it than the way I just did it. You don't have to pretend that this line goes all the way to the y-axis. Is all you have to do for a starting spot is substitute this number 3 in for x. If I substitute 3 in for x, then I know my first point is 17. That is 17. And I know it has a slope of 5. So all I got to do is go up five and to the right one to get my second point. And then I draw my line. I put a closed dot on it. Actually, the way I've drawn it probably isn't correct. It's probably like that. It's a steeper slope than the first one. So it's going to go something like that instead of the way I've drawn it. Only because I didn't realize how far north it went. I didn't know I had... I was going to have problems drawing it high enough up. So that's really our answer with that line being 17. So you don't have to draw the line. In other words, there's ways to draw a straight line without beginning at the y-intercept. They haven't really taught them to you until now. In other words, every time they've ever asked you to draw, a graph a straight line, you immediately you go to the y-intercept and then you find a second point based on slope, right? But in these piecewise functions, you can't do that. I mean, you can, but then you have to go and erase the part that's not applicable. So it's better really not to do that. The best way to do it is to find out the starting point right here and the starting point begins when x is 3 so when I'm on the line x equals 3 this this vertical dotted line here then the y value has to be whatever it is when x equals 3 and that's 17 all right Okay. To 45. Hold on, let me check the time. Yeah, we should have enough time. Now, 45 has three different domains. Right? There's three different restrictions. Yeah. I'm going to do those first. The way I do piecewise functions, I always start in the upper right. I start right there. 
I don't start with the function. I start with the domain restriction. So let me draw three vertical lines on here. And I'm going to I'll draw them all in pink. First one's at minus four. Okay. Yep. The next one is at one. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That shows you three regions. There is this region. There is this region. And there is this region. And now it's like we have three different graphs and we just have to graph this function. So let's go back, look at this first function. Now, again, if we were graphing that on an entire graph, we would start at the one and just graph a parabola that opened downwards. But it doesn't go through the y-axis. In other words, this function doesn't start except it goes from minus infinity to minus four. So wherever I have the uh, orange here, we've got to graph this function. Well, where do I start? I pick the point, minus four, plug it in. Minus four squared is 16 times minus three is minus 48, plus one is minus 47. So when I'm on that line, that's minus 47. Okay. Only it shouldn't be a closed dot. It should be an open dot. Why? Because it's it... less than four. Yeah. When it's great, when it's a less than or equal, that's what makes closed dots. But this is an open dot. So that's partly what I'm looking at. Now, the rest of that function, I know would go through plus one if it went through the y-axis. So I, I know where the vertex is. The vertex is at zero plus one. Let me think for a second here. That is actually in vertex format, if you think about it. A is minus 3, H is 0, and K is plus 1. So that's where the vertex of that thing is going to be, at 0 plus 1. Well, 0 plus 1 would be right there. So that function, the rest of that vertex, in other words, if I were to draw the whole thing, it would look like that, right? And in fact, it would look like that. If yeah. I were to draw the minus 3x squared plus 1 on the entire graph, it would be this pink line. But yeah. it only applies to the left of minus 4. So I've got to erase this part I don't need that part on there it's not a parabola in that range so let's figure out what goes in the blue well that's a little easier because they didn't give us a quadratic it's equal to 5 that's the function it's equal to 5. Well, what does that look like? What does y equal 5 look like? Is it just up 5? 
It's a horizontal line. And you're right, up five from the origin. So it's a horizontal line like that. Yep. Now, is the left side a closed dot or a open dot? Um, open. Based on that. Oh, it's closed. Is the right side of that line a closed dot or an open dot? Um, open. Correct. Because it's based on that. I shouldn't write it like that because that makes it look like it's less than or equal to. It's based on that. Okay. Now, the only thing we have to do is the third function. And we're doing the third function wherever my green is. Well, the cube root function. Oof, man. Cube root function, really, they have to do the cube root function. Um, again, if I plug in x equal 1, I have a starting spot. I don't know. I don't have to be able to plot the entire cube root function in its normalcy. I only have to plot what's left of it to the right of 1. Well, yeah. when I substitute x, 1 for x, I get 2 times the cube root of 1. That's 2. So I know where this function starts. If that's 5, it starts at 2. It starts right there with a closed dot. Now is all I have to do is plot the rest of the cube root function. Well... That's a little harder said than done. Here, let me figure out how to do that. That's the cubic function. So the cube root function. Looks like that. Yeah. We're to the right of that. So the only thing we have left of it is that. In other words, okay. we're, we're plotting that part right there. Just the part to the right of 1. And there's our graph. In other words, this is part of it right here, open dot. Then up here, we have that part there. And then to the right, we go there. And each one of these, if I was to label it, that's y equal 2 cube root of x. In the middle, this is y equal 5. And over here on the left, that's y equal minus 3x squared plus 1. And that's piecewise functions. In other words, they're really not hard. It's like saying, it's like asking you to graph three different functions. That's all it's asking you to do. But the key is it's asking you not to graph the entire function, but only the part of it that's to the left of minus 4, or only the part of it between minus 4 and 1, or only the part of it that's greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1. All right. Lachlan, I got a 4 o'clock I got to go to, so I'm going to let you go. Okay. I will talk to you next time. All right. Thank you.